we talk a lot about strategies and tricks game masters can use to help you run your campaigns. But maybe you aren't always the GM, or maybe you haven't run a game at all. Tons of questions come our way about how to play in a tabletop RPG. Questions like how to find a game, how to know when to take actions, and other conceptual roadblocks that several players, especially new ones, have to fight through during the course of their gaming journey. So, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight on Playing God. I'm Nick Logie, and with me we have Xander Plexus Punch Nolan. Hey man. Alright bro, this is an episode where we're addressing the players more so than Dungeon Masters, but there's still some insight to gain for running games. If you're new to role-playing, the first question anyone asks is, how can I join a game? Why don't you start by telling us how we can find an RPG to be a part of? Well, first of all, how I find games, and I find it easier, is to go into my local gaming shop and just talk to people about what games are running. A lot of the times they'll have message boards, or sometimes even just a simple cork board with slips of paper stating when the games are supposed to be held, who is running them, how, when, why, what system. Yeah, it includes a phone number. I think it, those are actually really cool because it's like you're going into a, a town square and like looking at the bounty board and seeing, hey, what can I do? Yeah. Uh, that said, it is far from a catch-all for most people. Uh, there are a few resources that are at your disposal, not only as a game master for posting your games, but also as a player. One of the things is the find game options on a site that we use called Roll20. It's fairly simple to use. You send a message, you uh, look through the games, see what kinds of things you jive with. There's usually some kind of uh, blurb about the game that's being ran. Uh, another good way is to uh, go ahead and fall into uh, Reddit. Reddit has a lot of options and a lot of places where you can find different games. Just go through the different subreddits where RPGs are concerned, and it's likely you'll find a gaming group that may or may not uh, be open to having a new player. That said... I mean, if you go to Reddit, there's enough subreddits for the specific games. So if you're just looking to play specifically Dungeons & Dragons or Shadowrun or whatever, then you could just mm -hmm. go straight to one of those subreddits. And it's pretty easy to find some people at that point. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, you might encounter in trying to find a new gaming group, especially if you're new and you're not really sure where to look, uh, things to keep in mind uh, are that, first of all, if you have to happen to suffer from uh, any kind of social anxiety regarding this, uh, we're going to cover uh, how to deal with the first-time jitters later on, but one of the things that you're going to have to kind of come to as a roadblock is that that anxiety is going to prevent you from being able to make that connection and pushing past that to find yourself a like-minded group of people is one of the first steps. I know it's difficult, but we cover a lot of things about uh, social anxiety and things like that in another podcast uh, episode here on Playing God. So if you feel like you need to do that, uh, refer back to one of our other episodes. Another thing that has recently come to my attention is that being taken seriously as a gamer is fairly easy if you are male. However, uh, I can't personally uh, attest to this, but uh, it has been brought up on several occasions through f several of my female friends that being taken seriously as a female are issues that gamers tend to that, come that plagues with the their gaming community, gender. whether it is a tabletop RPG or video games or any kind of game. Yeah, it's online play, it's everything. So, uh, first and foremost, know what you're looking for. Be mindful. When you're going that... into this, like, the the end goal isn't just to find a game. That's, like, yes. it, the, the end goal is also, like, whoever you're going to end up hanging out with, these people are going to be your friends. And yes. you're looking for a group, like, that has a lot of camaraderie and it's people who jive, like via a lot of personal preferences and mm -hmm. like you're, you're not you're not typically going to look for a game where you're going to meet like four strangers and then play a game and then not see them or interact with them again yeah you're you're uh, in the mindset of you're forming relationships with these people in one way or another yeah so um being aware that these people are going to be part of your life be okay with them as a friend. If they're not okay as a friend, they're probably not okay as a role-playing group. That's just something to keep in mind. Pretty much. And that's much. whether you're male or female. Um, another thing is 
if you can, I know that not everyone can, but if you can, try to stick to people that you already know or you're already friends with. If you know someone who runs a game or if you know someone who has played in a couple of games, talk to them about it. Get their insight, get their experience, especially if they're another female gamer because they'll be able to understand your plight. Beyond that, there are resources all over the internet for how to deal with things like this, how to find groups of like-minded individuals. College campuses are one of the places you can do that. Very common. If you happen to live near one. Uh, coffee shops, things like that. I generally just, the way I can kind of find a new game, I guess nowadays it's different because since I don't really play in games, most people are like, hey, can you run this? And games find me. Yeah, as a GM, you have no shortage of games. <laughs> when I was getting in, brand. when I was getting into like nerd shit, I was in college, and uh, a coworker of mine at the time, I didn't even know that he did any of this kind of stuff, and I didn't really do any of this stuff too. I just kind of gotten into Warhammer Forty Thousand. Like one of my high school friends played it, but we didn't really play much of it, and I wanted to do more, but I've, uh, and I never even thought to talk to this guy about nerd shit. Until one day he brought an Eldar like figurine, like a model from Warhammer 40,000 that I recognized. And he had it. He didn't bring it up. Like he wasn't brought, didn't bring it to me to talk about it. But I said, Hey, is that from Warhammer 40,000? And he said, Yeah, you know what that is? And then one thing led to another. And I was in way more 40K games that I even wanted to be in. But that opened up the, the way to branch me out into. It actually led me to what I'm doing now on this podcast. Because mm -hmm. if I hadn't said anything to this guy, we would have never been friends. And I never would have got, I probably never would have gotten into tabletop RPG. And then, yeah, you wouldn't be listening to this. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a, a rather uh, similar instance where uh, I just followed a couple of my friends. We went to a place that apparently was cool and the rest is history. I've been playing for the better part of 19 years now. I've been DMing for the better part of 12. So, uh, and if you've never gotten a game before and you can't find anybody else like through, I guess, more traditional methods, and but you have like friends or any even acquaintances who are interested in getting into something like this, you may have to just bite the bullet and be the GM, uh, even mm -hmm. if you've never done it before, because eh, everybody's got to everybody's going to stumble into it eventually and mm -hmm. having a group of fully new players then it doesn't matter how many mistakes you make because they're they're tripping along with you yep and uh just so you guys are all aware uh even if you're players uh just because playing god is typically about game masters we are open to answering questions and things like that offline so if you'd like to leave comments down in the youtube section for this or if you follow us on our facebook page you can send us messages almost directly that uh, address some of your more personal questions and we can help you as a player not just a gm find a group or find people and things like that we are also a resource for you to use at your disposal so keep that in mind as well yeah hit us up if you need anything uh, and be sure to hit that like button <laughs> Like, comment, subscribe. All right, so we've, we've let's say we found a game now uh, as, as this player. Um, you, you meet up, you sit down with the group that you found uh, or your friends or whatever, and you, you go to play the game. Now, we're not going to go into the specifics of rules for each rule set because that would take an eternity, but um, we're going to answer some general questions uh, that we've kind of received throughout the course of GMing um, about kind of like conceptual things. So this would be uh, stuff like, how would you communicate with the people? How do you overcome these first time jitters? Uh, like when you're sitting at the table and you got your, you got your character in hand, but you've, you've never role played before. So uh, Xander, what, what would you do to alleviate this? Well, uh, overcoming first-time jitters is something that you are going to experience in just about every facet of your life. So these tools you can actually use in the rest of your life, you're welcome. This is actually uh, something that I came across while uh, dealing with some of my own collegiate experiences. Uh, the first thing you should do is detach your self-worth from the table. It's okay for you to understand that <clears throat> your self-worth is not tied directly to this game and that feeling good about yourself is not going to be a reflection uh, of how well you do in this game, especially if you're 
a first timer. You're not going to be great. No one ever is when they do it first time. So don't feel terrible if you don't do well. I mean, even doing quote unquote well in an imaginative game is very subjective in and of itself. Yes. Uh, second thing, this is a two way street. They are also meeting you for the first time. So they are probably just as nervous about talking to you as you are about talking to them. So keep that in mind and recognize that this isn't just a on you kind of thing. Another thing that you should do, do your homework on the system. If you can, get a hold of uh, the role-playing game book on your own and read through things. Try to understand how the system works. Get a good working knowledge of it before you even sit down at the table, and that'll help you understand what's going on so that you're not lost in the sauce, so to speak. Uh, the next thing that you should do... Uh, it also and... impresses any new GM, regardless of how experienced you are as a player, that mm -hmm. you know the rules. So, oh, yes. Because like, we come if, across players that aren't. Yeah, if you, like, if, if you come into the game like having at least an understanding of how your character works, even if you don't really get the rest of it uh, yet, then that'll, that'll bump up like, the respect points e very yeah. easily from the GM. Yeah. You are seventy five percent there already. And since you could talk about the, is, since you know the game, that's a mutual thing to talk about, and that'll help mm -hmm. break the ice for the like a first group that you're meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is a technique that one of the techniques that you can use, uh, regardless of where you are, is called visualization techniques. Uh, professional athletes use it constantly. It works for them. It works for everybody else. Uh, first thing. Wait, wait, wait hold on. What, what is what is that though? I haven't actually heard of this before. Uh, envisioning yourself doing things uh, that would be received properly and received well. One of those things is be fully there and be committed to the moment. If you are distracted or you're in your own head, it's going to cause you uh, more anxiety and more uh, nervousness than if you. Put yourself out there completely. You're ready to go. For good or for ill, this is how uh, uh, you can envision yourself. The next is to envision yourself speaking calmly yet confidently. If you do this, even if you're in an interview or if you're anywhere else in the world, if you can visualize yourself doing it, you're much more likely to do it. And the third thing where visualization is imagine yourself making a solid connection with this person that you're speaking to. That, that's your GM, that's the other players. Make that connection because these people are going to be your friends. You're going to be around them anywhere from twice a week, once a week, every other week, once a month. But these people you're going to forge a lasting bond with. And this lasting bond is going to transcend the gaming table itself. So visualize yourself making that connection it's going to make things a lot easier for you. Another uh, tip that I had uh, come across is to chew a stick of gum. It's a psychological technique where if you're eating, you don't feel as much pressure because your brain is telling you, okay, you're eating, so things must be safe. Chewing a stick of gum can help uh, lower your anxiety, lower your heart rate, and help move you along in, this, in the setting. Uh, another thing is you're not as nervous as you look, trust me. You might feel really bad. You're sweating everywhere. You feel like you're just going to die. You're not as nervous as you I don't you know. Look. If I saw somebody walking up to my game table with waterfall oh, sweat coming off of their bodies, then I'd be like, uh, are you all right? Uh, yeah, you, you don't look as nervous as you are feeling in that moment. You really don't. Um, you can be sweating, but the likelihood of somebody noticing that is pretty slim to none. It's like someone noticing the thing about you that you hate most about yourself. It's, a, it's an old adage that they probably aren't going to notice that that freckle on the left side of your face has caused you severe physical tra uh, emotional trauma for your entire life. They're not going to notice it. It's not important to them. Uh, another thing is this is okay. Recognize and realize that it is okay to feel these feelings. Recognize that the other people at the table are also feeling those feelings. If you can get past all of these things, your first time jitters will be significantly reduced. I know that I use these techniques on a regular basis. I almost daily, especially when meeting with people for job interviews, when you're going in for a 
a home loan or a car loan or you're going in to speak to just about anybody in a proper setting for whatever reason, these techniques can help you work through it and it works just as well at a gaming table as anywhere else in life. So if you can't take note to this, try to remember these things. They'll help you in your real life. So now that we've calmed down a bit and we're actually playing the game, this is a good time to introduce like uh, when you make your first character to have like a kind of a se like a separate voice that you adopt whenever you embody the character. Uh, uh -huh. th this way, for, especially for new groups of people, it, it's a very clear distinction between when you're speaking out of play and when you're speaking in play. So when you're trying to communicate, because there's constant back and forth between like what people said out of game, what people are saying in game, actions that are taking place, um, then you want to adopt that voice just so, like, even if it's just a slight variation, then it's uh, it's very clear that as you're speaking in character, that doesn't necessarily reflect what you as a real person believe. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're for, if you're for some reason starting in like a darker set kind of setting, um, you may need to do some shit in play that you definitely wouldn't do in real life. Uh, but you, but with a new group of people, the way you phrase it and the way you word things. It could come across that you'd be like, maybe, maybe you do have the capability to do some of this shit if you're just using your regular, normal speaking voice. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to just immediately like separate the communication so you can compartmentalize it into an easier way to determine what's out of game and in game for you. Whoever the dungeon master is will be able to pick up on it uh, and it'll help them flip between like no learning about the real you and then doing what's going on in the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, when adopting a voice for your character, make sure that, uh, especially if you're new, that this voice is easily heard. I've ran into a lot of players where they, their first character, they decide to play a meek and kind of quiet character that doesn't talk a lot because they feel like it would be easier to deal with the fact that you're in a new setting and you're dealing with a system that you're not familiar with. That actually is only hamstringing you. If they can't hear what you're saying or you don't speak up enough, then you're going to be written off and put onto the back burner. Um, the problem with that from your perspective will look uh, it, it will look like what you are doing doesn't matter, and that will compound mm -hmm. the um, internal struggle that you're already going through. Uh, yes. Because even though the other players aren't just dismissing you like that, uh, they're – that they're, they may be interpreting that as that's the way your character is supposed to be. So mm -hmm. they're going to interact with you the way they perceive you want to be interacted with. That is exactly correct. Uh, and also, because of that uh, kind of thing, if you want to play a meat character that has a soft voice and rarely speaks, then l try to do it as one of your later characters. I know personally uh, a, a gentleman who at one point in time played a character at a sit-down in front of each other role-playing game that had taken a vow of silence. The player would explain the actions what? perfectly well, and he would explain things, but he would use physical gestures when the character itself was communicating. And it takes a lot of experience. It takes a really good game master. It takes an exceptionally good player and other good players at the table. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole group really effort. Work this out. And it can either go very well or tank miserably and a character that is small and meek and doesn't speak a lot is essentially taking a vow of silence if you're a really really good role player you can add slight inflections to the way that you do speak and you can add physical gestures that help people understand what's going on but it takes a lot of experience so playing a meek character later on when you're more experienced as a player It'll be more, one, acceptable, uh, and two, you'll be able to use other things to kind of augment the fact that your character isn't speaking a lot. But doing right out of the gate is not a very good idea. If you want to play a character and it's your first time, play something simple and play something that's kind of boisterous, kind of loud, kind of, kind of in your face. That way, one, it will help you with your confidence at the table. Two, you know you're always going to be heard. And three... <laughs> It will be so much of a uh, differentiation between I'm a new player and this barbarian that runs at them and grabs their face and pulls it in close and looks them in the face and says, I'm going to eat your soul and then rips them apart. 
that leaves a lasting impression. Yeah, I've had I've had new, new I've had brand new players come into my table that after like the first game, I have to sit there and like, are you, is this really your first time playing this game? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's like, yeah, it is. But let let's say you're not boisterous, like even when you like even as a an acting thing, like you just can't bring yourself to do it. So here's a decent measure that I would use for making new characters in situations that I wasn't familiar with. So I'm gonna go on a quick video game tangent here. Uh, if you like video games and are and play them a lot, if you play fantasy, sci-fi, whatever RPGs. If there's a character class that you find yourself drawn to and you like and you are comfortable playing in like from a controller video game standpoint, I would say to try to find whatever the equivalent of that is uh, in the role playing book. So Absolutely. if you like playing a roguish character, then well, there's a straight up class called rogue, so you should probably go with that one. You don't you. Yep. you it's all right to lean on tropes. Uh, I wouldn't say try to, I would actually say don't try to make a character that's too different from you right at the start. You could start branching out and doing like really weird stuff later that uh, as you get more comfortable. Yeah. Being comfortable in something that you're already relatively familiar with will help you seamlessly kind of pull yourself into from one game platform to another game platform. I know that the first kind of characters that I ever played were rogues, and then I went for characters that were punchy because I'm I was in the army. I'm very physical and <laughs> very in your face. Like that's just my personality, and so playing characters that were like that just seemed to be a good a good take for me. Uh, it's not until recently that I've kind of drawn myself away from that. Yeah, I started out tabletop games by pretty much playing exclusively spellcasters because apparently I like having to learn a bajillion rules, but <laughs> that eventually it's one of the things we tell them don't do. Don't yeah, I know. That's like your first I always and I always play wizards too. Like I don't play sorcerers when I'm doing oh, this. Like so I'm doing God. like the full spell book and all the complicated shit. Man. So I started out playing games like that. And surprisingly, over the course of the years I've played, I've ended up kind of adopting and having more fun with, with the roguish archetypes, there which I thought was odd. I never thought that I would be the one sitting in that niche, but apparently that's where I am. Yeah. Uh, another thing is um, if you find yourself in a position where communication isn't as easy and you are trying to play a character that jabs with you already and you've got these things already pseudo-sorted, when uh whenever you're sitting around with the other players and you're doing uh planning phases for like a uh a, a heist that you're about to begin uh try to make suggestions uh that highlight the strengths of your character and are things that your character would understand not so much things that you as a player would understand uh so if you're playing a soldier character because it's a simple class as fighter and you know that a fighter is supposed to be you know very hard on battle tactics and you know that that's a strength of the character uh you don't have to feel like you as a player don't have you don't have to understand those things as well it helps if you do definitely but that's what your gm is there for they are the filter by which you bring these things into the world that's you also what dice rolls are for for dice rolls exactly so if like you won't think you should know something you could even ask like do you if you're just unsure does my character know something like this? I ask uh, my GM shit like that all the time, where uh, they'll come up with something obscure, and even even if I don't think that my character sh would know it, sometimes I just ask on the off chance that there's some weird connection that they've made in the background that I don't see. So I'll be like, I might be a gunslinger, but am I familiar with the magical aspect of this certain in uh, thing? And usually the answer is no. But no, <laughs> but that's like I could still ask the question like you don't y y nobody gets on to you for asking the question. No. And uh, a good example of that is uh, my character Kenton from uh, Nick's game. I've mentioned him a thousand times so far. Uh, it's because we're still he, in the campaign and it's been going yeah, on for forever. Uh, he's not magically inclined. Barely at all. But he's come across magic enough uh, through the fact that he's uh, uh, been around 
spellcasters. Yeah, for so we're long. familiar with Kenton's noble upbringing, but that—that's kind of the point. It's like, yeah, you'll ask me things that are just bizarre sometimes, but yeah. I'll think about it for a second. And since you grew up with a lot of like a big library and you had a lot to read, like maybe you do know a little tidbit about whatever obscure thing you're asking about is. Mm-hmm. Like a language that may or may not be relevant to the story. Yeah, or I'll say no. In which case, we'll just move on. Mm-hmm. The the next point that uh, new players, more specifically, but even experienced players, are to come across things uh, in in our time as as gamers that make gameplay easier. Like uh, for fifth edition, there are cards that you can purchase online that have spell components and what the spell does and it's just a card it's about this is the exact same size as a playing card these these tools of the trade are the things that make playing the game easier especially if you're a new person to gaming as a whole uh then these things aren't necessarily needed to play but it makes it easier and more streamlined experience i'll put it this way i've never once bought any of those things I, I have uh, I have not purchased them myself, but I know players that have, and it's made their time significantly easier. I oh know yeah, that. I mean like if it's something you like, because I always like having stuff. Like the the spell cards themselves are cool. If I ever oh, yeah. if I ever played a game and would use them, maybe I'd get them. Show to pull a card out of the little deck and just plop it on the table. You can read it real quick, and that's it. You don't have to go sifting through the book and things like that. One of the other things is to do bits of research. Uh, regarding uh, how your character is is to be and not to be played. Um, simple Google search can tell you all kinds of things. Uh, and we are a community that shares the same kind of hobby. So there's likely an answer to a question out there already. Uh, and uh, don't be afraid to use us as a resource. Don't be afraid to use other YouTubers, uh, Reddit, other sub forums and things like that as resources because those things make your gameplay experience so much easier. You also, those same people water. would, if you like making stuff, those same people would eat it up if you made some kind oh, yes. of like flowchart for like a character class or your own reference sheet like that helps you. Personally, in games that I've played, I, for my spells, when I played uh, Omegas in Pathfinder, I made I made an actual spell book that I carried around. It had cool designs. I drew little little icons for the spells so I could flip to the pages. And then I had, and this is very important, I wrote down the spell verbatim from the book. So that way when yes. I referenced it, uh, there were no, no words, no rules, no, nothing missing out. And I even put the page number uh, from the book that I got it from. I only... I think I only got it from, like, the core rule book, but, like, still, being able to flip it open to the actual page just to verify did wonders. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, a good thing to carry around with you, uh, if you don't have a cell phone, some people don't, they choose not to use them, whatever, uh, is a calculator. Something that can make the addition and the math. It's simple math, but... I truly there, like, doubt whoever's to listening to this doesn't have a cell phone. That's probably they, how you're listening to it right now. That's probably it. But you might also be playing in a game where your game master insists that no phones are allowed at the table. You put them in a basket by the door. Oh, okay, okay. In. That See, that that's a much more reasonable <laughs> argument. <laughs> yeah, so have a calculator. It makes things much faster. If you're trying to figure out, you know, this is a, an 8d6 fireball spell, and you huck down 8d6s, which we'll get how to roll the fucking dice properly yeah i have that i actually have that in all caps on my notes because (laughs) that's a point of contention as a game master and a player that just really grinds my gears uh but we'll we'll talk about that in a sec yeah um you huck down these uh uh, these uh 8d6s to try and figure out your damage and now you're like all right five when you whip out your trusty dusty calculator uh from fifth grade when you had to get that graphing bullshit for no goddamn reason you say oh yeah the ti-89 yep oh yeah Mm -hmm. just whip that thing out everybody's freaking got one and oh i need to get mine it's really easy so okay Uh, yeah so even though uh 
this might uh, that might sound have sounded insulting to some of you because all of that is is basic addition but this isn't about like accurately getting the number this is about saving time so mm-hmm. if you have like an actual tactile calculator not a touch screen then you could just be like uh, like five plus six plus one plus one plus two plus whatever like yeah you could do that math in your head but it takes a little longer and if you get caught up along the way then that could derail the whole thing this is just a time saving measure it's just time saving and streamlining because as as a player what you want to do is try to make sure that you are saving as much time as you can with the mundane and the rule systems because the story is the important part and you want to try and move it along. If you're constantly taking time to reference something in the book because you don't have spell cards or you didn't write anything down or you don't have a calculator so all of your math is taking forever, those things you can do. It's uh, not like sometimes sometimes you have to do them. Sometimes you do need to flip open the rule book. Yeah. Like sometimes the GM can't just make a uh, an impromptu decision on something and uh, or you have to specifically understand what you want to do, then, mm-hmm. yeah, take the time to do it. Totally, totally do that. But if it's not necessary and it's a constant looking back for something that's fairly simple and should not take a lot of time or will be it will bog the game down. It's something that uh, will help streamline and make the adventure move more smoothly. So keep those things in mind. We're not trying to say that anyone is inept, uh, but this is something that – I do, and something that Nick does. I have a calculator right here sitting on my desk that I use when I play Legends of Latir for calculating my damage, and it just makes things quicker for me. Uh, as a GM, if you have several calculators or a computer that you can open up the calculator application on a bunch of times, uh, I use those to keep track of my monster HP because there's a lot of numbers usually involved in that, and that way I can oh, just yeah. hit, like, all right, the Barbarian did 14 damage, so, like, minus 14, all right, they have this much health. Oh, hey, they're dead. All right, so they're dead. Yep. It just makes things easier. Yeah, I actually, the I since I open up the calculator thing so many times, when a monster dies, I just close the window that they, <laughs> that they were on because I don't need it anymore. No, uh, it's gone now. If you kill the monster, I don't have to worry about rolling death saves, and if you spare whatever you're fighting, then you're probably not going to insta-kill it after you're done anyway, so I could probably just ignore it. Yeah. So let's talk about how to roll the fucking dice properly, because, like, we need to address that. This is yeah. This is a big issue. This isn't even just, like, a Starblade exclusive, like, we're upset at this kind of thing. This this is a problem that uh, ha- is, a- occurs across all game tables. So, mm-hmm. if you roll the dice like this, you need to stop. You pick up however much dice it is. 1d20, 8d6, anything in between, doesn't matter. If you pick this the die up and you put, hor- like, horizontal uh, velocity into the into the roll basically you're not rolling it you're more like throwing the dice don't just don't just stop rolling dice at that point use some kind of automated thing um the reason why this is such a big problem uh, is because there's several factors that come up and why we are dedicating a few minutes of talking about how to roll dice the first is when you do that it shoots the dice across the table because the dice are always bouncier than you think they are and oh yeah it will like bound past character sheets. It in some cases it's possible like if somebody has a reaction to try to like grab the die or like stop it or you reach across the table, you could knock over drinks, you could mm-hmm. damage equipment. There's other stuff that is kind of severe, but generally that won't happen. It's just something to keep track of. But the other uh, problems are that if your die doesn't Drops. hit the table and it falls off the table, then <sighs> My rule always as a GM is if you can't hit the table, you that does you can't hit the monster. Uh, like yeah. you're you're rolling dice. Um, maybe not that harsh all the time, but the other thing is that I will always rule like I don't care what the die says. If it hits the floor, it doesn't count. Reroll it. Like if you roll a crit success, too bad. If you roll a quick cr- a critical failure, then all right, too bad anyway. Uh, because e- either one, they're both canceled. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, there, and the reason I always make a hard and fast rule about that is because if you don't, you get this situation. 
Somebody needs to roll 3d6 for damage. Uh, the maximum you can roll on that is an 18. So let's say that they're, I don't know, the, this thing you're fighting has 17 HP. So if you get max damage, you, you down it and your party is saved. You roll all 3d6. Two of the dice stay on the table. You get two sixes. Hey, that's great. One of the, die, uh, one of the dice falls off the table. If you don't have a hard and fast rule for this, that now becomes nebulous. So if it, the die hits, hits the ground and it rolls a one, then it'll, some players will just be, be like, hey, uh, could I just re-roll that because it didn't hit the table? Alternatively, if, and if you're not consistent with this, if that die hits the ground and it's a six, then why would you, why would you let them re-roll a bad result but not a good result? Yeah, like they'll they'll look down, like they'll keep their hands away and just kind of point it's like somebody like confirm this. Yeah, so that that's why I always just say like if it doesn't hit the table, it doesn't count. It's a uh, good rule to have. I, I like you get to re-roll it, mind you. Like I'm not yeah. just saying like if you drop the die, you fail your action. Like that's too harsh. But no. you have to re-roll it no matter what. And I also make that clear that when I'm a player, that's why I, we're putting this into the player section. Uh, why, when I'm a player sitting at a table, I say to the GM, and well, first I ask them if they have a hard and fast rule like this. Uh, but if they don't, then I say, okay, here's what I do. No matter what happens, if this die does not hit the table, you will know that I don't care what it is. I will re-roll it. Just letting you know. Like, just something to, to let them know. And I've done, I, this has happened, because this still happens, <laughs> at, at games that I play uh like for Deadlands, for instance, I would roll a die, and Chris's glass table that we play on is ridiculously bouncy when it comes to dice. So, like, <laughs> if you barely drop that thing, it'll be like ping, 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 and it fell off the it fell off the table. It was a great roll, and I was really disappointed that I didn't get that roll when I picked when I scooped up the dice and like without consideration and just rolled it again because I was like. That's my rule. I don't care. It might have been the best rule I could have made, but I gotta stick but, with it. but I gotta stick with the expectations. So here's how you actually roll dice. Because we said a lot of what you shouldn't do, but here here's basically the easy way to like roll die that, that gives it the spin that you want because nobody just wants to like plop a die. Because the physical action of rolling dice is fun. Uh, it's just when people get super excited and throw the dice is when it's a problem. So take whatever the dice you're using in your hand is. Now, you, uh, I usually, you can either use your other hand to cup it and do like the, sh the shaky thing, uh, or you could just like shake it a little bit uh, open-handed as long as you're not too aggressive because then the die will shoot out anyway. Uh, and then just basically tilt your hand over the table and let the die just roll straight down. Just let gravity do all the work. Don't put any other forces uh, onto this. Just let gravity do its work. Roll, like let the dice go no more than like six inches above the table. And please don't measure that out specifically because that's weird. But yeah, <laughs> just you want to keep the, your hand high enough from the table that the die gets the, the bounce and the spin as it like rolls off your, uh, your palm uh, because that you know, helps with randomization and it's satisfying to do. Um, if you go too high, then you let it go. The die bounces like five feet in the air and then flies across the room somewhere. Uh, so just just pick it up. Just let gravity do its thing. Just roll the, roll the dice rod on the table. Or if you have uh, dice trays, then mm -hmm. even better. I would recommend getting dice trays for anybody who, who does like or who can't not do kind of the throw maneuver. This the way, if because then if you chuck the dice into the dice tray, theoretically it'll contain itself within the dice tray. Now, if you have a dice tray and you throw dice and it bounces out of the dice tray, you need to reevaluate how much force you're putting to these tiny plastic oh, yeah. uh, polyhedrons. Yeah, another thing, another tool that you can use that helps with randomization and you don't have to worry about whether or not that's going to happen is to uh, go on to several of millions of different sites, uh, go on Etsy, and just find yourself a decent dice tower. Or heck, you can even build one out of simple cardboard and some duct tape. Dude, let me tell you this. A friend of mine who I hang out with uh, frequently, his they got he and his brother have a 3D printer 
by the way, those are much cheaper than they used to be, I found out. Oh, yeah, they are. Uh, and he printed his own dice tray, and it looks sweet. It's like this spiral staircase that he has, like, this plastic cylinder around, so it contains the dice, and, it, like, the dice roll down the stairs and come out at the, um, at, like, a balcony-looking thing, and it's great. Like, you could straight up make this stuff, and oh, you yeah. can customize it to do whatever you want, too, so if... If you know, all you have is cardboard or just a, a, some balsa wood or something, you could you could make whatever your heart desires, mm-hmm. and it's something cool you could put on the game table as yeah, as you, like a set piece even. Yeah, if you like crafting things and you like doing little uh, uh, little bits of uh, of creation to help it augment when, you know your life or your experiences, then. Totally. Make your own dice trays. Make your own dice towers. Heck, make your own figurines if you really want to. Those things are all. That's why they got the 3D printer, by the way. That the the gaming community absolutely loves and adores. Like I've made my own dice trays and stuff like that. I've made some good ones. I've made some bad ones. I had made a dice holder specifically for holding dice uh, that was in the shape of a mimic. It was two feet wide, a foot and a half. deep and it had a lid and it looked like it was about to gnaw your hand off but you could take the clay lid off of it reach your hand in grab a handful of dice put the lid back and it's really cool and it's that is pretty cool it, it adds to your your experience as a gamer and it's one of those things you can set down next to your gaming table if you're a gm or even if you're a player and people will be like where'd you get that it's like oh i made that it's like oh that's sweet no, I made it, I made a dice box pocket. that it just all it does is hold my excessive amount of dice and it wasn't it wasn't a complex build mostly because I went to a craft store got one of those like blank wooden treasure boxes and then yeah. I just painted the outside with whatever I felt like which turned out to be a lot of weird symbols that I just wanted to put on there it looks cool and it you wouldn't recognize it from the thing I pulled off the shelf, but I didn't do anything structurally to it. I only did is painted the thing that I bought for, what was it, like two bucks at the store? Yeah, and, they're, they're relatively cheap. And I got that sitting on my bookshelf between my columns of RPG books uh, as <laughs> just kind of like this middle piece where I could get dice from. So it looks cool, and it serves a function. They're a great function, too, and it's an awesome talking piece whenever people who are uh, part of the community that you're a part of are like, hey, where'd you get that thing? Oh, no, I made... You know, yeah, just like just mind. like the story itself. Like, it's only limited by your imagination and what you're willing to put into it. So next we're going to talk about... You've got your dice. Now you know how to use them. <laughs> you might have built yourself a little dice tower. Uh, and now it's time to come I just to... imagine somebody with like a pressurized spud launcher but they had like it rigged for dice for the sole purpose of irritating me like they pointed at my face and pulled the the fireball trigger and it launches 8d6 at, at me <laughs> at like Mach 1 <laughs> wow that hurts worse than a paintball gun that hurts worse than a real fireball now you're coming to uh, the point where you're about to create your character let's uh take it to a step forward but also back and we're going to talk about character concepts what's good and what are some of the pitfalls that we've come across uh over over the years and how to deal with them and some of the things that you might think are not a great thing that are actually really good for you to remember the first one is and and this is this is something that that really kind of this is one of the things that grinds my gears is try to fit in with the party now that doesn't necessarily mean oh i know what you mean by this niche but your character needs to be in keeping with the setting it needs to be if it's a post-victorian uh very dark and gloomy world of darkness game the likelihood that you're a super peppy princess is probably not going to jive very well and it might grate against some uh some of the the themes now that's not saying you can't do that but there are by and large uh character concepts that if they don't fit in with the setting it just makes things more difficult than if they were to so keeping that in mind knowing the game that you're about to get into make your character accordingly 
What you I could do for is... if, especially if you're new at making characters, um, what you could you can kind of go in a little bit of a reverse direction when you do your character creation. Instead of thinking about who your character is as a person, just make the mechanical like class or actual like rule set thing that you want to have, and then like as you're talking to whoever your DM is about the about the setting or the other players at the table as you're getting into it, then you can kind of formulate your character around that. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you could, thing... t- you could take the mechanics and put pretty much whatever skin you want over it to, oh, yeah. to make it fit, but the core mechanics are the same. So as long as, the, as long as both those things are interesting to you, then it's a little easier and a little more seamless than it might seem. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing is when creating a character, not this stuff on paper, but the actual way this person is going to interact with the world, keep one thing in mind. This is something that was told to me when I was doing uh, LARP, was a character can make a joke, but a joke should never make a character. It might be funny. It might be an in-joke. It might be something that you know is really funny and you think would be really interesting. That uh, if the character is nothing but a joke – and it's not in keeping with the setting or the system or the way that you're trying to play this person, then it's probably just going to become irritating and it's so one-dimensional that they don't really have any other traits or any other qualities. And you kind of hamstring yourself Mm -hmm. by not playing a more complex character. There are places and times, I, I will admit, where a character that is made up from a funny bit is created and it's fun. There are times and places. All right, I've I've heard that phrase too. Like a, a character can make, can make a joke, but a joke can't make a character. I heard that, and my first instinct when I heard that from the mouth of the individuals that uh, you're referring to, I was like, Nah, I could figure it out. And so over the course of my gaming career, I have had characters. Great characters, mind you. Characters that are fully fleshed out and had some of the most dramatic thing, like things happen to them in play across my entire gaming career. And it was because I wanted to do something really stupid based on a joke. And then when I had that template, because like if you ever try doing this, the joke is like is the top of the pyramid. It's a singular point. You still have to have everything underneath it supporting that point. So the joke, you could start with that, but as you are playing the character uh, and like developing the character, you, ha- you have to add more layers. It has to be more detailed. All right, let's go with Big Jeffrey because that was – were you around for Big Jeffrey? No. He was my Shadowrun character. He was a troll used car salesman, and the – only reason I did that is because there was a giant bomb quick look that Jesse showed me where the the giant bomb guys made this whole fucking stupid like joke around this guy's username from Roller Coaster Tycoon, I think it was called. Roller Coaster Rampage, that was it. Yeah, Roller Coaster Rampage. Uh, but his name was Big Jeffrey. And he, he talked like a vague southerner, and he was kind of aloof, but he would always sell you used cars, and here's what I'm going to do right now. Why don't you come on over to my used car lot? We got all sorts of deals we can give you today. And they just went on with this joke in in their quick look, which their quick look was like 20 minutes. But I, t- I thought that was so funny, like w- with the this kind of character that they've made up on the fly for, for a joke. And I was like, you know what? I could take that, and I can make that into a real character. So, yeah, he was still had the stupid accent. He still had Roscoe, King of the Everglades, his pet <laughs> basilisk, um, who it, he was a, it's an alligator, I think, in the giant bomb thing. But yeah. I was like, you know what? No, it's, it's a shadow run appropriate. He's a troll. He's a used car salesman. Uh, everything about the joke is the same. Roscoe was a basilisk instead of uh, – or a Komodo dragon instead of, a, uh, instead of an alligator. But over the course of that game, even though I started him out like this, there was a moment, like three fourths of the way through ca- the campaign, when I, when Big Jeffrey, as I was doing this in character, I delivered an a full eulogy 
at the funeral of one of the of my NPC best friend, and it was a heart wrenching speech from this guy who just started out as a complete joke. Yeah, I would say to wait to try to do that stuff until you have more experience because yes. that's a little trick. That's a tricky dance to do. Um, yeah. So as, if as a new player, I would totally agree with Xander and just say don't make a character out of a joke. Think about a person first, then go from there. Then make jokes. Another tricky dance to do are evil characters. They suck. Don't play them unless you know what you're doing. I've seen it done amazingly well. Like uh, Jesse. All right, look. So, hey, Xander. Um, so with with evil characters, th- this is an in- this entire thing. Like uh, when it. Because there, there are two. Here's a quick look on two ways to play evil characters. Because honestly, we're we're gonna need to do an entire episode on evil characters. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, the first is if you're playing an evil character, you your char- you have to be willing to let your character die, and you have to work with the GM if you are in a party of otherwise good or neutral characters. Because otherwise, it'll be very disruptive. That's the short version of that. Uh, the second is you could play an evil character if you're playing an evil campaign. I would recommend yes. not ever doing that as your first game or your first few no. games. I.e., don't play them unless you really know how. Yeah. Uh, like with, the, with, with Jesse's example that Xander was going to bring up, he had been working with me since the beginning of the game, like pretty much right at like before game one started uh, about playing – an evil character basically and he i basically so i had to tell him certain plot elements not without that's not without spoiling anything but certain directions things were going so that way his evil character could help direct the rest of the party there um mm-hmm. and when he made this character he knew he was an antagonist so when the party had to fight him and kill him he had to have been fine with letting his character be permanently destroyed and he was, yeah. because he knew he was getting into that. And then he, he, yeah. he had a bunch of cool, really cool characters throughout the Legends of Latir. And uh, I'll tell you right now, that character and the way he played it was masterfully done. We, we knew that he was doing things that weren't exactly in keeping with what we were trying to do as good players. But it allowed the opportunity for us to attempt to help him atone for his sins, like he said he wanted to do, which was all a ruse. But we also, it also brought up a dynamic with other characters that sort of questioned the status quo. And it really gave us a lot of opportunity to understand things from the other side of the coin. It's really well, it's really fun when it's well done. It really sucks when it's not well done. So make sure that if you're going to play an evil character, you know what you're doing, you've been playing for a while, you've talked to your GM previously, or if you're playing an evil campaign, muck it up murder everything like total evil campaigns can be so much fun but don't play an evil campaign if you've never played before it will well, ruin e- evil your evil campaigns could could ruin people's experiences even when you're ex- when you have a lot of games under your belt which is yeah. why we're going to have an entire episode about playing an evil game but for the meantime that's the short version yeah uh another pitfall is i've seen this a lot um and brooding isn't always cool you know the strong silent type like we said earlier unless it's well done i mean it doesn't really work well in a game where you're mostly talking to people the entire time yeah it it doesn't work well in a cooperative gameplay setting if you're going to be a brooding character give them something other than brooding you know maybe they're brooding about a specific topic and they completely refuse to talk about it like they used to be the king's uh bodyguard and uh, they were on a quest to help uh, deliver the princess to another land because she was to be married off to another lord to bring two kingdoms together. But somewhere along the way, uh, she was captured, and his entire goal in life is to try and figure out what happened to her, try and get her back, but he doesn't want to talk about it to the other characters. That is an acceptable amount of brooding where a certain instance is concerned he operated well with the rest of the characters uh on every other thing but when it came to this one subject he was like no i don't want to talk about that it was stonewalling about it that creates depth and that creates an interesting character but nobody i've ever met in my life 
is just brooding constantly. Nobody. Here's a, 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 a an easy reference is everyone. I don't care who you are. Everyone in the world. There is at least one thing, one subject that they want to talk about and will talk about a lot. Oh, yeah. Like we do. What? Yeah. So what I would say, if you're making a character that you're going to go into doing a, kind of a broody aspect of it, pick a thing. One, two, however many you want. Um, but at least one that if it's brought up, this character will go full hog into talking about it. In fact, you you might have to have the other characters shut this character up about what they're talking about because you're going for too long. Oh yeah, that uh, that that happens in real life too. So so some <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, pit, a pitfall that I see um, that is isn't the worst thing, but it definitely breaks immersion, especially for people who have done a lot of games. Don't it, like don't copy and paste any character that. You, you know or that you want to play all right i'm going to just come up with an example just real quick say that you really like the concept of luke skywalker because he's a pretty iconic character you want to play luke skywalker that's fine if uh if you're playing a star wars game you could play someone who has a similarity to him but the problem that i see is when players will like copy and paste directly like the character yeah. looks the same. They act the same. Maybe they even have a same similar name, name uh, or the just the straight up same name. And if you shouldn't be playing in this if you're new, but if you if there is a game that has like a bunch of things pulled from like various worlds and that is an acceptable thing, then yeah, go ahead and do it. But I'm talking about the broad strokes. Like you're going into a you're going into a fantasy game, but you're trying to play a character that you really really liked from The Bleach. Witcher. I was thinking of The Witcher because that's more toned down. But yeah, Bleach works too. Pretty much anything like works. I've had people attempt to play literal copy pastas of like Koga from the Inuyasha series or a wizard slash spellcaster who was actually Witch Hunter Robin. Like things like that that just – I'm like, oh my god. Why like, are you, you even can, playing? Like yeah, you could, you could do that kind of thing. Just you got to give it your own twist though. That's the important mm-hmm. part. Like you you can edit a few things and make it your own. You don't have to like redo the entire character, but they can't have when you're going into a game, don't expect them to have the same story beats because you're not playing the anime. You're not playing the movie. You're playing a different thing entirely. This character will evolve over time regardless of what you try to do. So you need to yes. be able to accept that and like 10 games down the line when something bad happens to the character and then it doesn't jive with the internal story that they came in with that needs Mm -hmm. to be able to be changed to reflect the bad thing happening and not like try to stubbornly stick to the original concept yeah that in and of itself is a pitfall in which uh characters regardless of whether or not they were based on something just don't see any development like, everybody who just wants them to be, like, a static thing that is the same at the beginning of the game, middle of the game, end of the game. Yeah. And yeah. I'll put it this way. Okay. If you watched a movie or if you read a book or anything that had a static character, like a static main character like that, you would hate it. It didn't it. evolve? It wouldn't you be would, interesting. It would suck. It, it would suck really probably, It probably wouldn't have gotten sold enough to, for you to even get it in your hands to begin with. Those are some of the big pitfalls that, that, that we've had. You said bad things. Are you going to get into something yeah, else? These are, these are some of the things that you probably shouldn't do. Right. Some of the things that uh, you should do uh, when creating a character concept uh, is to use that template. Uh, like Nick had said with the whole Skywalker thing, it is totally okay for you to take something from something that you like and something that you enjoy and make it your own. That is definitely a good thing. Trust me. I've made characters based on hundreds of different characters from like animes and TV series and things like that. It's a good idea to use something as a basis that will give you a really well-rounded and well-accepted understanding for how this character is going to react, and it gives you something to fall back on if necessary. Creating a completely brand new, all-from-scratch character is damn near impossible it's going to be no, i wouldn't like i wouldn't say else. so it's, it's just i mean if you go down that route then no idea in ever is original uh, uh, yeah but like 
That's why I try to stay away from that. So, um, but I see what you're getting at, Xander. So, wh- how about we reframe uh, Luke Skywalker carbon copy into a very similar but still different character? Because I actually kind of did this. That's why I used Skywalker in this example. I didn't. I didn't do like the copy and paste thing. But when I was playing Edge of the Empire, mm-hmm. I wanted I wanted to play somebody who would maybe eventually become a Jedi, because I. Wanted to, I like the cool laser sword and the space magic is what it came down to. But in Edge of the Empire, like this is this takes place after well the original trilogy at least. I don't know if I can't remember, I don't think it factors in any of the newer movies. But what you could do is if you like the character. So what this guy did was he knew of Luke Skywalker because he was an in universe character that he could emulate. Now since he only knew the fantastical parts of Luke's life where he blows up the Death Star and all the other crazy stuff that he does. Um, he, he, this character doesn't really, didn't really know about the like family life or any of the other subtle stuff. Even though I, I based this character off Luke, you could the part of the character progression could be like uncovering the ancient scripts of the Jedi and to eventually like try to craft himself, make himself become more like his idol. Now, over the course of this game, my character basically didn't totally agree with the Jedi for various reasons, and I, I don't want to get into the whole, all that philosophy. But, <laughs> like, even though I went started out with the outset of, like, yeah, he, he's going to kind of end up like Luke at the end of this, he kind of ended up as more of a gray side Jedi, or gray side Force user, I guess. Yeah. Even though I had that so close to, to Luke... It, at the end of the day, like, the character wasn't the same. Didn't have the same name. He aspired to be like his idol, but never really got there. Yeah. And uh, having a character, uh, and this is another pitfall, is make sure that your character, when you create them, has some kind of grander goal in mind. They're not just bumbling through life. You as a real person have wants, dreams, and aspirations. You want to finish college and you want to get a good job and you want to have kids or blah 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 these people have wants they have needs and they have things that they need to do in order to feel fulfilled as a person so having a character that has a goal in mind for everything that they do is absolutely something that you should look into and the flip side of that is another pitfall is the campaign is supposed to be super awesome and epic your backstory doesn't need to be. Keep it simple. The characters don't have to be overly complex to be interesting and fun to play. And that's also a lot more things to try and keep track of and remember. But if you have a general idea of like a goal that they want, like they want to become prince of this land. And they started out as just a pauper that lived with his uh, ailing aunt. And uh, he went off in, in search of becoming a knight so that he could one day be crowned prince. And that's his goal. That's the thing he's always working for. If he's always working for that goal, you'll never know. Uh, you will never not know. Uh, also, double negative. You will always know what your character is going to do in a given situation. You'll have an answer to the question. So you see yourself presented with a problem. How would a prince handle this? You already know. You already have that kind of ideology. So taking one of those those goals and one of those aspirations and, and making that the core of your character's uh, character uh, is absolutely something that you want to do. It'll make you a good role player. It will help you evolve as time goes on. And it may come to fruition that your character figures out he doesn't want to be Prince because he's talked That's actually what I was princess. about to say. Like one final pitfall to, pay, to piggyback off what you just said was your character may not actually achieve these goals. Just like in real life, things happen, things change. Maybe the yeah. character doesn't even care about the goal after a certain point in time or it's changed to something different. You have to be able to adapt to that um, because you're not writing a static character. An example of this is my character Kenton. He started the game knowing that he wanted to gather all of the races together and create equality and that he wanted to be a politician. It's what his father was or his adopted father, but it's what his father was. It's the only thing that he really knows how to do. It's all he's ever wanted for himself. And now that he's staring down the barrel of the opportunity, he's about to have the option to do exactly that. And it could be he's come to 
the conclusion it might be more than he really bargains for. He's starting to really think, maybe I want a simpler life and uh, I don't want to have to have other people's lives in my hands. That kind of alteration to a character's goals and motives uh, can can definitely create a much more three-dimensional character, but the thing that Kenton has always stuck with is that he wants all people to be treated equally, and he will do whatever he can to do that. Even at his own... I can't remember the word for this. Expense? Uh, yeah, at, at his own expense. He'll, he will sacrifice of himself to achieve that goal, and he's willing to do it and has done it on several occasions. Indeed. So having a goal makes the character better, in my opinion. So, have so, a let, goal. so let's move away from the character aspect of it, and let's go summarize a few key questions that people have uh, asked me in terms of like literally just sitting there and playing the game. So the one of the first questions uh, that I've been asked is, how do you know when to ask questions? Oh, that's a really good one. A lot of this requires like feeling things out. It depends on the type of GM and what game they are trying to run. So if a GM is presenting a location to you and they're describing the scene, I unless there is like some critical action that you have to interrupt, like some guy like somebody's stabbing your character, like as part of this description, then you need to react to that. But if someone if a GM is describing a scene, let them finish. Even if it sounds like a cutscene, like let them finish because mm-hmm. they will they're imparting this information to you they're uh, it's setting the stage so that way you know what you is around to interact with so you don't have to ask a billion questions later uh, so but once they finish the description that's a great time to uh, to add other questions like or to bring up something that you're doing so if maybe you're at a bathhouse and there's like a jacuzzi around then once the gm finishes the description maybe your character is just maybe that's a good time for you you to say my character goes and sits in one of the jacuzzis uh or you could also use this as an opportunity to ask maybe more questions like uh if the uh, gm neglected to say how busy the place was then this is a perfect time to ask are there a lot of people here is this place busy a lot of it is just like Finding the right pause point to ask the question. Yep. If proper timing. Yes. Uh, I I would generally stay away from asking questions if there's like things being looked up because then you don't want to distract from finding the correct answer. But you could you could also what I do sometimes at a table if I'm not sure if uh, I should be able if I should interact with the game without like disrupting something is. I might just straight up like raise a hand or something and act like I'm going to speak. If the GM, because that usually gets the attention of the GM, uh, if the GM turns and says uh, "Yes, what?" then that's usually that, that you've already like broken the cycle anyway. So you might as well just ask the question. But if they look at you and they continue describing whatever they're describing and like look back around the table, then put your hand down for a second. Let it rest. You might find the answer to what you are about to ask in the description that your GM is finishing. Uh, I know that's happened to me a lot of times when I'm running a game where I'm in the middle of something and then someone says that they're either doing something or they have a question and it basically was the next sentence that I was going to say to address that. Uh, But they've interrupted. I might as well just go ahead and answer the question since it's already happened. But uh, then I just continue on with my description anyway. A good time to ask a question is also, or like just make statements or whatever it is, just take actions in general, like play the game, is if, is if somebody else is, has just started talking, don't interrupt them. If, you, if you're sitting there and they're, and people are wondering maybe what to do, like looking around or like checking their phones or whatever, then that sounds like a perfect time to just even spitfire questions or whatever you have uh, at the GM. And... The, the reason why we're emphasizing a lot of asking a lot of questions uh, and how the timing and everything works is generally if you have the question, other players have the question too. Uh, yeah. Or if you're trying to do something generally, the other players might be doing something similar or interacting with the environment uh, in a way that 
applies to you. So if you say, I want to take this vase and chuck it across the room, then be as the vase is sailing across the room, then one of your one of the other players is like, you know what, I want to catch that and fling it back or whatever. Even like mundane shit like that. It could be it could lead to a lot of interactions as long as you're like looking for the social cues. Um, it this is infinitely harder to do online yeah i've run into this problem countless times because since you uh, especially if you, if you can't see the other players or the gm then this is really difficult to do uh because you can't tell when the pauses are intentional versus like when someone is like just taking a breath because you can't see that there's nothing to indicate that then it just sounds like someone has finished talking so what usually happens is like three players will try to chime in at the same time quick remedy to that is probably just webcams if you're doing an online game i know not everybody has those or are comfortable using them that's why i haven't started using mine yet uh in legends of latir but for my further online games i'm definitely thinking that's going to be a mandatory thing because too much communication is lost with just audio yeah yeah it is you guys can't see all the hand gestures and stuff i'm doing behind the screen (laughs) Yeah, you guys can't see uh, you. You as a GM can't see the rest of us doing our uh, exasperated crap when Karks decides to. Oh uh, no! You'll fly if, if out of the planet. oh you won't have to see the GM because you'll hear the. Uh, <laughs> what are you trying to do? <laughs> the next thing that uh, uh, we can get into is uh, how to plan your actions. Yeah. So with the, yeah, the, it's not the, your. Turn. Right. This is this is where the timing aspect comes in. Uh, I was going to bring this up earlier when... Oh, yeah, I was like looking up rules when we were talking about that. So when you're planning your action, that's why we put it especially when it's not your turn. You yeah. want to be paying attention to every what everybody else is doing. Pay attention to the grid, what the GM's describing, all that stuff. You want to pay close attention to that when it is not your turn specifically because you are going to use that time as things are happening to adjust your plan uh, and figure out what you are going to do when it does get to your turn. Nobody likes it. It doesn't matter who you are. Nobody likes it when it gets to your turn. And th- what the most common thing that irritates me is, uh, what's happening is the question that somebody will ask. And it, the answer kind of varies, but sometimes I will default to, you weren't paying attention at all, so... Your character sees this, and you don't describe anything that uh, like that happened between, just like the immediate freeze frame that their character comes back to, because that's the way I way I think of it. It's like if you're if you don't care enough about the game to pay attention, like at all, I don't care enough to catch you up on the stuff you missed. So your character also doesn't know what's going on. Now, if, uh, it does come uh, points in time where real life has a, a tendency of interrupting things, especially where the gaming table is concerned because you're in one spot for a long time and, you know, there's other things happening in the world. Say you get a phone call, you have to take a step outside and you have to take this call because it's important. When you come back, that is perfectly acceptable. The GM and the other players... I mean, if that happened to me as a GM, speed. I wouldn't actually continue the game until you came back. I would actually say, yeah. like, okay, perfect. You're going to take three minutes, break, use the bathroom, get a drink, whatever. But uh, uh, under those circumstances, it's okay. But if you are sitting there texting on your phone uh, or scrolling through Facebook because it's not your turn and you're kind of bored, and then the GM says, all right, so uh, what are you doing? And you turn and go, huh? Yeah, yeah so no, don't, don't do that shit. It's that not shit. as bad oh. if you're playing a more simple class like a fighter where you, can, where you could just be like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to go over here and hit this thing. It is a totally different thing when you're playing a wizard or a sorcerer or something or like a druid that it gets to your turn and you're like and you need first you need to get caught up on everything that happened and then second you have to look through all of your spells because you didn't know what you were going to do uh and then you feel rushed as a player to try to do that that's why when I'm do when I'm playing I I don't like methodically plan everything I'm going to do I I personally have a vague idea of what I'm going to do and I know the rules of my character, so I'll I'll be like, I'm going to use this, this, and this. And then when it gets to my turn, if something changed, I'll adjust accordingly. But otherwise, I'll describe just what I'm doing and just make the roll. 
Yeah, that uh, that piggybacks on something that we've said uh, on many occasions. Please know your mechanics. Know what your character can do. Because if you don't, that bog sings down and really. And if you're ha- really if you're having problems like keeping track of the game, then what I would recommend is having like a little notepad nearby so you could take notes. Um, and this. Because take notes is basically silent. You could keep jotting stuff down throughout the entirety of the game to help you out. The things like yep. names for first thing I do whenever a uh, new character is introduced, via it, 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 whether it's a player or an NPC, I don't care who it is. I'm writing down their name. I usually also write who's playing that character, so I have a reference later on to know who's who. Yep. Uh, that's the first thing I always write on my notes, and then afterwards, like you put like important plot points or like this is the mission that we're going on or this is something to follow up on later uh if because if you jot down these notes if if there's like a lot of puzzle pieces to connect uh from like an overarching plot then you could look in your notes and say and see like i have a reference to time spiders what are those about and uh then you could follow up with the gm by just being like hey i want to investigate this thing that i wrote down Uh, Taking notes is a really – it's a very overlooked thing. Uh, I know personally I don't take notes nearly as often as I should, uh, even as a player. I take a lot of notes as a GM, uh, but I don't take barely any as a player, and it's actually shot me in the foot on a couple of occasions. I'm fairly uh, fairly experienced, uh, and I can generally follow what's going on without taking notes a lot. Um, but I have a lot of trouble with names and things like that. Uh, but the, the broad strokes are, are, are generally okay. So know what you need to take notes on, what's important for your character to understand and to know. And you as a player, because a player is not infallible. You are going to forget things. Things are going to change as time goes on. If you have notes on them, but you have a two year long campaign and you have, uh, and, and, you're not taking dedicated notes on everything and you're like wait didn't we meet this character once before and the gm's like hang on a sec and they have to flip through their notes too that's one thing yeah because the, G- the gm will have like a fuckload of notes that they have to sort through oh yeah and uh if you're taking very meticulous notes like if that's the thing that you want to do and you want to chronolize or chronolog- you want to take notes chronologically order yeah you want to chronologically order uh, the game and the story and everything and how it works out, that's cool, that's fine, that's acceptable, if that's something that you want to do. But uh, write down some important names, a couple of important facts and things that uh, you know realistically mean something to you as a player and to your character, but know what you need. This kind of depends on a game-by-game basis, and you usually you don't find this. And I don't do this as a GM, but I have met a couple GMs that do this. Um, and that is like... If you ask a question about, like, what has happened, then basically the GM will respond with, what do your notes say? Because they basically don't allow you to roll memory or whatever uh, it is for the system. They will straight up be like, if you don't know, then you don't know. I don't do that because I think that's yeah, a little too I harsh. Because that, that, that requires that – makes, that makes the players feel like that's a – you have to take a paranoid level of notes. Yeah. That's not what I that's not the kind of game I want to embody. So I'll usually just say, Yeah, you remember this thing or yeah, this is vaguely what happened. Like I won't go into the full details because that would be wasting too much time. Unless it is relevant to like the immediate story. Where I will go into like, yeah, you guys did this, um, and you discovered this, this, and this which led you to believe this certain thing. Like, I'm not telling yeah. them any answers, per se, but I'm telling them what they experienced be, uh, if they ha- didn't happen to write it down. It's been a couple months. Like, it, you don't remember the exact details from two months ago yeah, no. on a specific two-minute section of this t- uh, four-hour game. I, I don't describe to that either because I feel like it's uh, it's punishing real people for real person problems. Yeah, it's mean spirit. kind of messed up. So the last thing we want to talk about is uh, is just how to follow the plot of the game. So we've mentioned this before. One of the big tells to let you know you might want to follow this route or do this certain thing is if the GM keeps mentioning it, and it, uh, then it's probably important in some way or another. 
it might be misdirection, but since I mean you're not going to uncover that until after you follow the plot anyway. So uh, I would say like if if it's like your first few games, maybe don't don't try to go off the rails too much. Uh, it isn't it is an open world game regardless. So like don't feel like you have to railroad yourself into doing certain things. But if there's something on the map that's getting alluded to, if there is a name that keeps popping up uh, in in your interactions with NPCs or objects that you find in the world, then you should consider like you should consider biting that carrot and going to do whatever the thing is. Yeah. Or you could use that as a prompt to learn more about it. Like you don't just because you know about a dungeon doesn't mean you have to go in there to discover what's up with it. You can you can have your character take like research actions or talk to NPCs. Maybe you go bar hopping to see if there's any other adventurers around who may have gone into that dungeon and know what kind of shit to look out for. There's yeah. there's more you could do that doesn't railroad you, but it also still lets you like follow the story. Yeah, and uh, pushing the plot button, as I like to call it, and just seeing what happens isn't necessarily the worst thing that you could do. Being scared that harm will come to your character is part of the thrill of these games, and it's gonna happen, regardless of whether or not you push that plot button or not. Your GM likely isn't going to punish your character for engaging with the story that they are writing. Well, yeah, they and want to they share do, the story. Yeah, if they do... Perhaps you need to find a better GM, refer back to the first point that we made on this episode, but engaging in the story and, and helping your GM tell the story that they brought you to the table to tell in the first place is what they what would help make the game more streamlined and it would keep things smooth and it offers an opportunity for your characters to, you know, interact with things that, you know, it's obvious the DM put a lot of time and effort into. And uh, one of the things that we we say as a GM that no content uh, survives first contact with players and your players are only going to see about 70% of the things that you prepared, if that. So, you know, if they're, if they're saying over and over, like, this guy has the answer to this guy has the answer that this guy has the answer to the questions that yeah, you see. Yeah, maybe just go fucking talk to that guy to and that guy. then you could save – I mean, you won't have to – have your character do a bunch of asinine crap just to get to the same conclusion. Just go talk to yeah. the dude. It would, uh, it saves you time and, uh, you know, uh, engaging yourself with the way the, the environment is, uh, is pushing itself forward. Uh, I've had, uh, characters where making decisions, especially early on in the game will have consequences and a way to teach players about those consequences is to have something happen that may not be very great, but it has come to come to call where those instances created some of the best memories and the best story beats. Like uh, a guy, uh, I think it was a dwarf, tried to kick in a door, and in kicking in this door, he did not uh, have the rogue look at the door to see whether or not it was trapped. And when he kicked at it, the door instead of crashing open like he expected it should uh split itself in half and the parts of the door went down and up and created a very tooth like maw and it chopped his leg off at the knee now the character gets healed and now he's missing a leg but it offered the opportunity for the player to then get a prosthetic that had a negative one to their dexterity which wasn't terrible because they already had a, a 17 to begin with so they didn't lose any statistics uh, it just took them a little longer to get to that 18. Uh, so as the story progressed, they were then known as the guy with the peg leg. And when the characters got to a point where they could restore his leg, uh, they did. And when the the healer said, look, I want to try and restore your leg so that you have your leg back. And the guy was like, you know what? Nah, I kind of like the peg leg. I keep a bottle of whiskey down in the boot. <laughs> it's cool. Like things like that. A bad thing happening to your character doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It's telling a good story, and it's creating moments that will be remembered long after the game has been played. You don't I see a movie and see that the protagonist has, it gets away scot-free the whole time. No. Usually only so, at the end. So pushing the plot button and 
you know, testing your luck and figuring out what's going to happen. Even if the results could be bad for your character, it's not likely going to be a character death unless you're doing something stupid that is obviously going to get your character killed. You know, like uh, so. Okay, if, all right. One, one, one more thing. Floor. Right. One more thing uh, about this is. I'm sure some of you are saying, like, what if it's a plot that my character wouldn't interact with? Well, that's patently false because you can always find an excuse to have your character interact with a plot, like, no matter what it is. You want to know how I can prove it? I don't want to go to work tomorrow, but guess what I got to do to go make money and pay my bills? Uh, It's a plot that I don't want to interact with, but I gots to – and yep, that's yep. that's just a real life example. You can come up with all sorts of stuff for your fictional thing. Yeah, like the prince has asked you to go and in- investigate this thing. He has asked you to do this. You don't necessarily have to do it. You can ignore the plot entirely and completely. But because that has been the thing that's been asked of your character, later on you'll find out that you know the prince doesn't trust you and nobody in the kingdom believes that your word is any good and the thing that you were going to go and investigate happened to you know end up with uh the prince and his uh uh his soon-to-be bride the princess being killed so now he's an angry bitter old man and you're choosing to not interact with that that plot has had consequences and or you could just make it you could make the very easy excuse of if nothing else your character hears this problem and thinks, if I don't do something about this problem now, this will come back to bite me in the ass in the future. That's all yep. the excuse you need to get into a plot. Exactly. So if your character who is a pious uh, cleric and would never deign to even speak to a necromancer, much less try and convince him to give an orb to them uh, so that they could continue there, that you're trying to save the world, guy. You might have to bend a couple of rules in order to save the world. Which is more important, the lives of millions or your piety? I don't know. That's kind of part of the plot for Legends of the Tear, actually. But, yeah, uh, I know. That's, that's... <laughs> and that wraps up our summary on how to involve yourself as a player. If you have questions of your own, put them down there in the comments. Be sure to subscribe to Starblade for more podcasts, and we'll see you next time on Playing God. Later, man.